I just, I need to stop the bleeding. Her nose again. I need some help here. Welcome to episode 9 of Merchant Slipped. In the last episode we took a tour of our entire fortress. We've done some work on our food supplies and made a little temple in an effort to appease Kivish, who is our first stressed out dwarf. We've gotten a migrant wave, putting our total amount of dwarves up to 101. And last but not least, it became time for a new election for a mayor. A lot of dwarves are interested in the position, so Tyrus was pretty worried. We join our dwarves again on election day. All the dwarves have come into the bulbous berries to cast a vote. After carefully counting the votes, Raal, the tavern keeper, got us all dwarves together. Tyrus is standing next to Raal on a little podium when Raal announces the winner of the elections. After counting the votes I can confidently say that Sodel will be the new mayor from now on with 67 votes. Sodel steps up to the podium and shakes Raal's hand, and offers his rents to Tyrus. All of a sudden Tyrus explodes with rage. Who do you think I am? Do you think I will be voted out? I am the leader of Merchant Slipped. I have given everything. I lost the use of my arm defending this place and I put the groundwork in place for a new fortress. Do you really think that I'll let you cash in on my hard work? Sodel takes a look at Tyrus and addresses the crowd. You have voted. Just like you have a few years back. It is the law that these votes will be honored. And I thought you were a lawful and honorable man, Tyrus. Those were the promises on which you have been elected, so do the right thing and step down. Tyrus' eyes fill with tears. But, but what will I do? I can't do anything. We'll put you on a graving duty for now. There's a lot of rough stone in the fortress that needs to be smoothed. Tyrus looks at Sodol and then at the crowd. Moral is standing in a corner with a battle axe ready. She has a smirk on her face, as if to say, Go ahead, resist, make my day. Terrest realizes that his time as a mayor has come to an end. Fine, fine. He steps off the podium and makes his way to his office. Before leaving the bulbous berries, Soto calls out to him. Oh, um, Terrest? I'll be living in the mayor's office and bedroom from now on, so if you can clean out your cabinet and stuff today, that will be great. Tyrus clenches his fist and walks out. So, our fortress has a new mayor. I guess the dwarves were fed up with all the little accidents that have been happening with dwarves getting hurt, and the fortress leader who can't use his main arm. He was elected as a strong military leader and he couldn't really keep that up, so now he's just relegated to be one of the dwarves. He doesn't have any particular good skills either, so Sodal assigned him to be an engraver. That's something he has a little bit of skill in, and even though his situation with his arm, he thinks that's the best job for Tyrus to do for now. I can't help but feel a little sorry for him, but well, that's just the way life goes here in the fortress. Let's uh, take a look at our new leader, Sodal. He killed a cave crocodile in the caverns a while ago. Yep, that's right, it's another military dwarf. This time he's from Obox squad. He's one of the latest additions since he's only joined our fortress two migrant waves back. He has been injured once in the fortress and interestingly enough when he was down he's been brought to bed by, well, Tyrus himself. He wasn't actually hurt though and he hasn't got any treatment so I'm not sure what was going on there. He worships Taurus Guardblocked, that's the god that we made our little small temple to recently. He doesn't really have any friends or family here in the fortress, only a bunch of passing acquaintances. He comes from the incinerated lances, just like nearly all of our dwarves, as that is the fortress our starting seven came from in the year 100. He is 85 years old, very muscular and strong, and has an iron will. He respects the law, values friendship and honesty, and deeply respects those that put in hard work. He is confident but not proud, and he prefers modesty. Well. Looks like a pretty good leader to me. Let's hope he can lead our fortress further into the future. He came in at a great time as well, because our miners have just about completed the digging work on the new fortress. 
Now all we have to do is smooth all the walls. And by the way, that's something Tyrist, our previous leader, can help us with. Furthermore, we have to put in the furniture. The first thing our new leader ordered is bedrooms to be made ready. Quite a lot of dwarves don't have a bedroom at the moment, so that's something we'll need to fix. He's also prioritized the creation of the temples. We'll try to get those done as soon as possible so that we can finally fulfill the religious needs of most of our dwarves. As our dwarves are working on the bedrooms, we get a message that Nil, our metal crafter, has been attacked by a cave crocodile in the caverns. These accidents happen from time to time as wildlife walks in and out of our caverns, but Nil is unlucky in that he's been hit pretty badly in his leg, severing some of his nerves. Because of that, he collapsed to the floor. He did punch the crocodile a few times, but now he's just lying there. The diamonds of meeting quickly deal with the crocodile and Nil is brought to the hospital. In the caverns, we've mined a lot of copper ore, so to pick that up, we have to let our dwarves into the caverns. It is risky and there will be probably be more incidents, but we can't close it off. Our medical dwarves work on Nil for a while, but he probably won't walk without crutches again. Sodel also takes a look at our stocks and puts in a mandate to have three bucklers created. Looking at our stocks, we have a lot of armor and shields, but no bucklers at all, so that's not a bad idea. Our metal crafters start work on the bucklers right away. Here we can see them creating them, and since we got quite a few copper bars ready, they are finished building them right away. Sodel is very happy about that. He's feeling jovial about it. Good. Some of our dwarves have found him to complain about the lack of lavish meals as well. He displayed empathy as the dwarves were yelling at him about it. And when Kivish came to him to cry about her dead cat, he felt empathy as well. He's looking like a pretty good mayor to be honest. Looking at our new fortress, we can see that the rooms we dug out to be our new barracks are done. Some stones still need to be cleaned up, but generally they are completed. We'll wait for a new entrance to be done though, before we start using the rooms, since if we ever are attacked, it's important that our military is close by our entrance. We've also gotten our bedrooms to a usable state. The walls aren't smoothed yet, and a lot of stones are still lying around, but there are about 50 new bedrooms ready for dwarves who didn't have a place to sleep. As we're looking at our bedroom layer being worked on, we can see our fortress leader helping with the engraving work as well. Even though he's a mayor and in the military, when he's not training he's helping around in the fortress. That's good to see. The guy's putting in the work to gain the trust from the general population. A while later I was looking at Kivish, our stressed dwarf. I've taken her off all duties except for stone crafting, but at the moment we don't really have any stone crafting jobs, so she can just relax. As I'm following her around, I can see her eating alone in the dining room. After that, however, she goes to attend the meeting. I wonder what kind of meeting she's going to. Let's follow her around. Here we can see her chasing Sodel. Basically she's in tears here, running after the mayor to complain about some affairs in the fortress. Sodel notices her chasing him and goes to his office to deal with things. Here we can see her following him into the office. She's been in there yelling at someone in charge and crying on his shoulder, which gives her a satisfied feeling. On the other hand, Sodel, patient as always, listened to her cries well and reacted empathetically. In the end, she feels a little better. In fact, as they are both going their separate ways, I notice she's no longer stressed. Wow, our new leader is really pulling his weight. Great job. We'll keep her off hauling duty to be sure she takes it easy for a while so she doesn't slip right back into a bad mood again. While our dwarves are busy working on our temples, we get some battle reports from the caverns. We've temporarily restricted our dwarves out of the caverns, but some monster slayers are still roaming in the caverns. One of those monster slayers is Eden Matu Moses. Here we can see him fighting a giant cave bat. Or, well, fighting. He is bashing its head in with a shield, and as soon as the poor bat regains consciousness, he runs away. The thing is though, the bat has been so badly injured, it passes out again, and then... With <laughs> newfound confidence, he then comes back to continue bashing the head in. Here we can see him running away again. Hearing the commotion, his colleague monster slayers come walking by, probably wondering why Eden doesn't just finish off the beast. Rockfield, a human hammerman, has enough of it and kills the bat with one last blow. Well, way to go there, Eden. Great job. A while later, our temples are done. The last few tiles are being smoothed and we still have a bunch of rocks laying around, but I've designated all temples to their own gods. 
There are only a few more gods that a handful of dwarves worship that don't have their own temples yet. Though with all the rocks that need hauling and the floors being smooth, very few dwarves have the time to actually come and pray now. Well, a time and place for everything I suppose. And while we are watching some of our fortress guests moving in to pray in our temples, the dwarven caravan arrives. Great stuff. We have quite a few meals to trade, so let's get to hauling. In the meantime, the outpost liaison comes to meet with Sodel. He brings news and rumors from the world around us. Looking at the world map, we can see that the goblins are attacking our civilization. The fortress Town Lobsters is under attack from the Pirare Muxpital. The liaison urges us to prepare our military. It won't be long until we are under serious threat from the goblins and our civilization could use our help in destroying the goblin threat. This might be a good thing to prepare for in the coming months. We could train a military to attack the goblins. The goblins are a strong faction in the lands of Ushil Neral, and to make sure our dwarven civilization has a chance to survive, we need to act. Sodel makes a mental note to expand the military. After the talks have been concluded, the trading can start. We hold a bunch of meals and excess weapons and armor and cloth to trade, so we can trade for a lot of stuff. We buy a lot of steel, gold and all the animals we can take, instruments, alcohol we don't produce in our fortress, you name it. It's a big trade, but we have gotten a lot of new stuff for the fortress. Very nice. Looking around, I notice another dwarf that is having trouble with stress. Here we can see Ilral Abanatol in a meeting with Soda. Luckily Sodel responds sympathetically, so he can do something to calm Ilral down. But we'll take Ilral off duty, so he can take it easy for a little bit as well. We need to keep an eye out for any stressed dwarfs. What we'll do for now is just make sure to take any dwarf that's feeling stress off of all duties. That way they'll spend some time in the bulbous berries or our temples and they'll hopefully improve their moods. Talking about moods, Sodo gets a message that Kog, the Satmepthev, is stricken by a strange mood. He runs over to the clothier workshop that we have just built in the hopes of making some new clothing for dwarves and claims it. Sodo makes his way over to try and talk some sense into Kog, but he is just met with a very angry dwarf screaming that he needs logs and bones and tanned hives, metal bars and plant cloth. Sodel orders our other dwarfs to try and make the items he requires, but we do have quite a few of those items in our stockpiles and Kog is just not getting them. When our dwarfs offer him the items, he just screams in their faces and throws them into the air. So I'm kind of worried about his mental health. And sure enough, just as I feared, a week or so later we get the message that he has been stricken by melancholy. Here we can see him wandering the fortress aimlessly. He doesn't answer any dwarves and just walks around looking at the ground. I hope he'll eat and drink, but I won't hold my breath. Aw, poor guy. As our new fortress is starting to take shape, we'll need a lot of furniture in the future. In order to up the production of our masons, I've put a couple of workshops in the middle of our stone stockpiles. This way our masons don't have to haul the heavy rocks halfway across the fortress to their workshop to start work. So they'll also assign a couple of more dwarfs to be masons. We have four masons now and three workshops. That way one of the masons will have some free time and the other three will always have some stuff to do. I hope this will increase our levels of furniture production in the short term. While we are working on furniture for a new fortress, we can also start looking at our entry building leading into our entrance tunnels. Our dwarves have tunneled from our entry in our new fortress all the way up to the surface. We've not yet opened the tunnel up all the way, since that would mean our entrance would be vulnerable to attacks. Right now we are ready to build the entrance building though. We'll carve out a bit from the side of the hill here and construct our entry building around. We'll roof it up and construct a bridge to wall off the entrance if needed. Now while we're watching our entry getting built, you might wonder what all this blue stuff is here on the ground. Well, it's not the best side, but it's a huge trail of vomit. Basically what's happening is that the visitors to the bulbous berries come in and get absolutely wasted. And then when they are drunk they leave our fortress, vomiting all the way until they are off the map. Now it hasn't rained for quite a while, so all the vomit is still laying around here. It doesn't help that our haulers have had some free time as well, so most of them are getting into work drunk as well. 
that and the fact that the average dwarf hates being in the sun, which nauseates them, and the sight of all the vomit on the floor probably isn't helping either, so... yeah. With the refuge right there, it wasn't the greatest sight to behold, but with all this stuff here... Uh, let's just hope for rain somewhat soon. In the meantime, Zuntir Birkergoden has gone into a fey mood. Luckily, we had everything he needed and he's made Itatunas, an Orthoclase bracelet. This is an Orthoclase bracelet. All craft worship is of the highest quality. It is encrusted with rectangular granite cabochons and cushion green tourmaline cabochons. Decorated with giant bat bone and encircled with bands of round basalt cabochons. Violet cut green tourmalines and tin. This object menaces with spikes of Orthoclase. On the item is an image of Virtue Texas, the gilded oil, the rhyolite figurine of dwarves in pig leather. There's also an image of cut gems in copper, and an image of emerald cut gems in one humped camel bone. <laughs> Very cool. We've also spotted a little elfling running around. Sexel, our elven baby, has grown into an elven child. She's playing make-believe in the fortress. We can see her here in the stockpiles, playing around. Examining her closer, we can see that she's doing well. She's enjoying playing make-believe and loves the memories she has of the performances she watched growing up. She felt euphoric due to her inebriation. <laughs> Man, I don't know what her mother gave her to drink, but she's at least embracing the dwarven way of life. She's growing up to be a great addition to our fortress. As our dwarves are laboring away, I get a message that a cave crocodile is seen near our cave entrance. Now, we've got plenty of messages like this in the meantime, and usually I dispatch our military to take care of the situation quickly. However, this time I notice Mafal is near the entrance, on his way into the caverns. I don't have a clue what he's going to do, but he's heading straight for the crocodile. I have dispatched our military quickly, but they might not be in time. The crocodile and Mafal start fighting. Mafal jumps away from the attacks and turns around to attack. Oh no, Mafal, you're not a military dwarf. Don't risk it. I cannot just stand by. This might require an answer. And he punches the crocodile in the lower body. Oh, this can't end well. Punching a crocodile? Oh yeah, that's what I was afraid of. The crocodile bites Mafal in his lower body, tearing the fat. Mafal keeps punching though. So easily broken. This doesn't scare me. <laughs> it might not scare you, Mafal, but it sure as hell is scaring me. I don't want to lose you. The crocodile bites Mafal on the left upper arm, tearing apart the fat. His pigtail cloak and coat are ripped to shreds. And he just keeps on punching. He isn't really doing a lot of damage, though. The crocodile keeps ferociously attacking Mafal. He keeps missing, but then Mafal screams out. He's been bit in the lower body, tearing the muscle and bruising the spleen. Blood is spraying onto the cavern floor. Mafal feels the warm blood gushing down his legs. His face is starting to get pale. I must withdraw. <laughs> I think you're right, Mafal, but is it too late? The cave crocodile grabs Mafal by the lower body. He bites Mafal in the right foot. Many nerves have been severed. The crocodile is really doing damage now. Mafal tries to kick the crocodile away, but he only hits his tail. He's trying to punch, and with all the adrenaline rushing through his body, he musters the strength to bruise the crocodile in his guts. Well, I guess that's something, but that's not nearly enough to seriously hurt the thing. The crocodile, now even more angry than he was before, bites Mafal in his foot again. He tears apart the muscle and bruises the bone. The attack also opens an artery, and many of the nerves are severed, and the ligament and a tendon has been torn. Oh no... The crocodile latches on firmly and shakes Mafal around by his right foot. There it goes. Oh, his foot is ripped off and it's the only thing in the crocodile's mouth now. Mafal drops down onto the bloody cavern floor. With his lost strength, Mafal tries to scratch the crocodile's eyes out, but oh, it has no use. The crocodile comes in for another attack and drops Mafal's foot on the floor as he's doing so. Mafal doesn't really have the strength to continue this. He throws a few punches, one even knocking the wind out of the crocodile for a second, but ultimately they don't do a lot of damage. And just as Mafal considers giving in to the pain, the military arrives. 
Obak comes running in and slams his shield into the crocodile, and the force of the blow moves the crocodile off of Mafal. He grabs his axe and finishes the job with a few blows. Mafal looks up from the cavern floor, smiles at Obak before losing his consciousness and blacking out. Get me the bandages. I need to stop the bleeding. We're loading again. I need some help here. <laughs> 